Hello, Meester Jeroen. Are you ready to review the secrets? Of course, Meester Thijs. Aha. Uh -huh. The Crown and Scouts. Hello, Rotterdam Whitecar fans. Welcome back to our channel. Today, we will unveil all the secrets and everything you need to know about uh, the Crown and Scouts. From tactics to hobby to aesthetics and uh, ways to play them. You will learn it all in this video, so watch till the end. So you will be fully prepared for when this unit hits the shelves. All right, so before we're going to start, first off, we would like to thank Simon for getting us some early access to the Crown and Scouts. Yeah, massive shout out to the guys over at Simon for helping us out. Exactly. So let's dive into those aesthetics, Thijs. Yeah. If we, uh, what do you think about uh, the Crown and Scouts? Yeah, first of all, uh, others have mentioned before that the box art is spot on. It gives the fairy tale forest vibes. It gives the whole mm -hmm. almost Studio Ghibli-like uh, forest with... Uh, all the magical uh, yeah, essence sort of. Yeah. I really liked uh, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and I also liked because it's a neutral unit that they did not paint them yellow or green. Yeah, that bit of green, mm -hmm. but it's more of a neutral feel to the box art as well. Exactly. Yeah. So they're being painted in a different color scheme than most of the units, especially yeah. when they more muted. Are uh, what is it? Uh, loyal to one of the sides. So was really cool. Uh, of course. Well. I've painted the unit itself. It was really cool to do as well. Uh, completely something different in comparison yeah. to your your average unit. Yes, there is armor again and some uh, trims as well. But as you mentioned, like you don't have a lot of cloth, or ex uh, especially on no. the horse and everything, which was cool to do. It's a proper scout horse. It doesn't yes. have any armor, just some some, exactly. some gimmicks on the front with those the, the circles. Yeah. But that's it, no armor, no cloth on the horse itself. Yeah. So pretty basic. Exactly, yeah, it feels, as you said, it, it feels like an, an scout on horse. Yeah. And uh, I think in comparison to the rest of the range, they fit perfectly in there. What do you think about the sculpts? Because we, there, there was some discussion about, oh, first of all, Mickey, and I watched Turning Ground, they do have a sword and a shield on every model. So <laughs> don't worry about it. Yes, they're all left-handed. That's another thing. Yeah. Uh, but what do you think about the poses? Because they're quite different, everyone. Exactly, yeah. So uh, I think one is, is kind of weird because it's looking a little bit like this. But when you see the movement in the unit, so I've placed them now in the front, mm -hmm. then it makes sense because they're making some sort of advantage so on galloping, the unit. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then if you're doing that, you're, you're getting pulled back by your yeah, body, sense. which makes sense then for the skull. But if you see it out of the unit, it's like, oh, that... Doesn't make any doesn't sense. Doesn't make sense no. though. Uh, and further, yeah, you've got one really high up that wants to make it would make a slash and oh, everything. Slash, yeah. That that's one is really cool, and the other one is just galloping forward, shield in front, and the sword as well. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one is just galloping with the weapon in the holster and the shield. So I, I really feel that they try to show the motion and that they're a fast calf compared to other uh, yeah. cavalry units, and that's why you have a bit of awkward posing because they're being pulled back by the horses and they're. You also have to know that they're scouts, so they're probably moving through a lot of uh, dense wooded areas. Yeah. So they're not going straight forward, but they're pulling and pushing. And I think that if you combine those things, that it really makes sense that the poses are a bit quirky to say uh, uh, individual, but as yeah. a unit, as a unit, sense. they come yeah. together. I think they did this already with like uh, the previous units that came out, yeah. like uh, Stony Shore Pillagers. Some of them are really wicky, but when they come together, they look absolutely As amazing. Uh, Stone Crows, they also had a few of those poses that didn't 
fully makes sense. Yeah. And as you said, like they, they try to make it now a bit more it's, aesthetic it's, as a unit. It's cool. I think that's something that changes a lot. Yeah. I mean, uh, previous sculpts you've seen that they just have a sword on the left, sword on the right, a bit like this, a bit like that. But they go for bigger movements. Yeah. I think that really makes the models more interesting. It's what awesome. did you like about painting the most, uh, Jeroen? Um, so painting them, uh, well, uh, of course, you can paint them in two colors if you would like to, or one or neutral. net. Or neutral, indeed. Depends on what your uh, favorite style is. Uh, for me, I will definitely buy, when they will hit the shelves, buy a second one. Uh, but for now, I paint them in my Stennis colors. Mm -hmm. uh, was really a challenge to, to make them standing out for Stennis side. Because, again, like I just had mentioned on the box art, how can you make that fitting? Where do you want to put the colors on? Uh, because especially, well, I make them uh, with some black as main color and yellow as a side color to really yeah. give that Baratheon feeling. It was quite challenging, but I think I managed it. I was quite happy they with the results. They look good, so uh, you're yeah. almost uh, finished, I think. So, uh, yeah. uh, well, you're probably going to do uh, an attachment in them, so it's not really that bad. Exactly, and the other one that isn't finished yet, I will make a painting tutorial for you guys out there. Because, Ooh, that's uh, cool. So keep, uh, keep on watching. Uh, exactly. So we'll have a painting tutorial as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, another question, is there something you learned about this miniature when painting this mini? Because a lot of miniatures, what I especially have, sometimes you learn how to paint cloth better, sometimes just like armor trim or like detailing or certain elements. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about? Um, well, again, I, I really, when I'm painting Baratheons, really love the uh, armor and all the detailing on there uh, in combination with the cloth. So, yeah, for now, I just paint them a little bit better ready. But I found a little small technique now. If you combine them, armor and cloth, then you can really put them and stand out as part mm -hmm. of a loyalty or anything. So that was really fun so to combining do. Combining textures. Yeah, but I think the main one here is for me the trim. The I really trim. In, enjoy painting the trim. And when I was painting the gold them... Trim, uh, right? Yeah, it's a gold trim for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When I added that to the unit, the unit elevated right away. So they, they yeah, look really, really cool, cool in, in silver, but when adding the trim, and so in my case with gold, they really get to that next level. So they really start to pop okay. out and everything. So uh, yeah, that's definitely something I would say with these means is popping out. Cool. Awesome. Let's go to the next uh, section. Yeah. That is? Uh, going over the unit and some combinations. The unit card. The unit card. So, okay guys, let's go over the, the unit card itself and a few ways on how to add them in your Baratheon Force. So, let's go over the card first. So, the Crown and Scouts, they're a six-point unit, and they have got the following uh, abilities and profile. So, the unit itself moves five inches. Um, they've got an attack profile from seven, four, and they hit on fours. Their armor save is four plus, and their morale stat is six plus. Further, the unit comes with Two abilities. The first one is Mark Target. That one is more of a defensive one. Uh, and that one is, of course, at the start of a friendly turn trigger. You can make one unit in long range and line of sight vulnerable. And their second ability is Tactical Reposition. That one has as a trigger at the start of an enemy turn. One unit in short range, which also includes themselves, can make a shift from three inches. So, when we're going to look into what makes this unit really special, these are a few things that I think makes them special. First off, it's the first neutral unit in the form of cavalry for both sides of the Baratheon side, because at the moment Randy had a six-point unit. This one is now neutral, so you can also put this one to Stennis. Um, it's another unit that can really help moving your units faster over the board, because we all know as Baratheon fans that movement is really a problem. And with this tactical reposition, can really make some cool plays in there as well. And they're also, in my opinion, a really fast unit when it comes down to objectives. So, for example, they can start in the middle and they can also then move really fast towards the sides to create or a flank charge or maybe even a rear charge. And those were a little bit my thoughts. And let's go over some ways to play with the Crown and Scouts. Okay, so guys, let's go over a few ways to play the Crown and Scouts. Of course, these are my ways to play. So if you have other options, those options are also fine. These are just some examples. So first off, we're going to 
towards the aggressive side. So as we mentioned with going over the unit card itself, the unit has marked target and to abuse this to a full maximum, we uh, will showcase you a few ways to play on how to set up a good combination. So one of them is of course setting up the marked target, so start of a friendly turn, we ditch out the vulnerable token for on the unit that we would probably want to charge. Uh, and then probably from the side or the front with a more stronger unit. Uh, that could be Stag Knights, uh, could be Kingsmen, or maybe in the side with some help from, let's say, the Riders of High Garden. You can really ditch out your punch uh, because the vulnerable token is there. And with the Sundering on there and everything, we will get a lot of damage out. So. Let's go over the way right now. Okay, so here we have an example on the battlefield itself. So here we go. At the start of friendly turn, we're in long range of the 30 Sworn Shields here. So we will set up the mark target to make it easier for Stannis. So we will play the mark target. This means that the Tully Sworn Shields will become vulnerable. And then I will activate the Baratheon uh, Kingsman. And we'll declare the charge here. And eventually, because we're already on the five, we will probably make it. And now, because there is a vulnerable token, the chances of doing damage are way higher. So here we've got one of the other examples as well, as I mentioned. Uh, here it's setting up the Rise of High Garden in a good combination to also benefit their damage output. So start of a friendly turn again. We will play the Mark Target ability. We will target the Tully Sworn Shields here to make them vulnerable. And then, since our uh, Riders of High Garden aren't activated yet, nor have a token on them, we will activate them with the six inch movement. We will easily get to the side and then declare the charge on them. And well, since we're within the six, we can always make it. It really only depends on the uh, roll that we have. But now we've got 10 dice hitting on fours with a vulnerable token on there and minus two because the pikes or have the lance ability of course so they've got sundering and in the side so this means also we can maximize the damage output for mark target okay. all right so and as you just saw this was one of the first techniques we just showcased you uh, this is an aggressive one one i really like especially in combinations with a few again this is just one there will be more you can figure it out for yourself so then we go a little bit over the defensive one, uh, but this can also be working for an aggressive one. So the other option that they have is tactical reposition, of course. So as we mentioned with the card again, Baratheons, of course, have trouble with movement. And with this unit, we can really get our units a bit faster towards one side or maybe to block certain things off. So where I would use probably this one mostly for is advancing forward or try to charge block my opponent to get in one of my weaker units. So let's go over a few examples right now. So here we have one of the options that we can use with the other order, tactical reposition. So at the start of enemy turn, we of course wait if, uh, in this case, Thais, his Storm, Storm Sword Shields have something or another ability. Thais, do you have an ability? No. No? Uh, we have them because Thais then forgo his action. We have one. That's a tactical reposition. We will now place our Kingsman or the unit in this case. Well, in this example, Thais probably wants to charge the Kingsman here, uh, maybe to block them for advancing more forward. So we can or move them three inch back to make it harder for the Tully Sworn Shields to get in. Or we can also move forward to make it easier for them, but set them up in a trap that we want to have so that we can move with other units around it. This is one of the options. Let's go over the next option. This is one of the other options. So in this case, Thais can now currently charge my Tully, uh, with his Tully Sworn Shields on my Lord Lightbringers. These I don't want to have, of course, in combat. So here we'll have another example. So first off, start of an enemy turn. Thais gets the opportunity to do. You have a start of any turn? Nothing. Okay, well, we have, we will use hidden the tactical reposition. And we've got Stennis here in front. And they are within six, so we can use it. And then we will slowly move them three inches this way. 
because with this, we will now charge block Thais with his sturdy sworn shields because now he can't reach our Lightbringers and he needs to go over the King's Men. And with these then we can still shoot at the Tully Sworn Shields or we can fall back and use a little bit of more positioning. And this is probably one of the tactical repositions which can definitely protect your weaker units. All right, so, and this was the second one I showcased you. Uh, in this one you could again see an aggressive and a passive way to use it. Uh, and this is one I truly, truly like because here they will probably shine. And well, now we've been over a few ways to play, now it's time to get over some army lists. So for our narrative list, I've, uh, I've gotten the task to come up with something cool. I've come up with an 8 activation Stannis at the wall full mounted list. You'll be thinking, why? Well, we have 6 more units so we can do shit like that. So it's gonna be King at the wall, Stannis, our commander, in Champions of the Stack to give a really buff unit as the core of our army. And of course, two of those Crown and Scouts to be moving around, doing stuff. Then two Dragonstone Nobles, because I had to fill up with more and more and more. This is actually going to be an eight activation list, guys. So it's really full of a lot of movement and a lot of activations. Then for the NCUs, I've come up with something devious. Davos Seaworth, because he can reroll charge distance. And that's something you really need in this game, especially with cavalry. And it's really fun because he is also there. And because we're at the wall, of course, we have two others as well. So we have Shara Errol and Axel Florent to fill up those slots because they're four point attacks, uh, four point NCUs. I didn't have a lot of points left after I added uh, five combat units. So that's my list. Uh, yeah, the narrative is quite easy. It's all calf, it's all running forward, it's a fast Baratheon army. How fun is it that you can actually do stuff like that right now, especially with the Crown and Scouts, because they have so, yeah, they are just six points, so you can really fill out the full list uh, with them. So uh, I hope you enjoy this list, and we'll probably play it uh, sooner than later on this channel. Thank you very much. Okay, well, guys, uh, now I will do the more competitive army list. So for my competitive list, I've chosen for Stannis, the rightful heir. Uh, he's sitting in the unit of Kingsmen. Uh, unit of Kingsmen is now possible due to the fact that we have the Crownland Scouts. We've got Unit of Baratheon Halberdiers with just a Messi in there as an attachment, pure to get Stannis' his cards out really fast. Uh, then we've got the Crownland Scouts, and then as a final unit on the board, we've got some Relore Lightbringers, including Davos Seaworth at the attachment version. Uh, as NCU lineup, I've got Alistair Florent, Peter Baelish, and Shea. So, why did I put the Crown and Scouts in here? Well, for everyone that already knows uh, this sort of variation of the list, Stannis the Right for Air, all, uh, all his cards are going about uh, ditching out tokens. So, with the Crown and Scouts now having marked target next to Stannis, Justin Messi, the Halberdiers, and the Shea, we have got very options to bring out those tokens towards our opponent because these. Uh, tokens will of course give us benefits so that our units won't be hit that much but also of course we can uh, benefit from those when we're gonna go in the aggressive stand because many of our army has sundering or with cards we can create sundering fissures or that kind of things and of course we've got the most important card that we have here tactical approach and tactical approach of course we can get out with Justin Messi if we don't pull it with letters or in our opening hand. So it's a seven activation list. It's a bit more classic, but I think, um, yeah, the, the, the token mechanic is so strong that probably most armies won't benefit from it. And due to the tokens, I think the Halberdiers, the Crown and Scouts and the Kingsmen will be your punch. And then the Lightbringers will be your punch from far away and getting those uh, healing processes started when we'll need it. And that's the competitive list. Also this one we will play during uh, some time on the uh, channel, so definitely keep an eye on that. So guys, this is our full review of the Kremlin Scouts. I yes. hope you enjoyed this video. There's just one thing we're left to do. Exactly, yes. Rank the unit. All right, awesome. We have a special ranking mechanism we will introduce to you right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Maesters, we can earn our, shack our, our chains yeah. and our shackles. Um, yeah, 
by, by performing tasks. And I think we will have a little scale from tin, copper, bronze, silver, so, gold, and valerian steel. Valerian steel. Yeah. On that scale, you know. Yes. We have, by the way, we have not discussed this with the two of us. Yeah. So we have no idea what we will vote first. Yeah. So in this case, then I would actually ask you, what do you think, Thijs? Because I am through and through Baratheon player. I've yeah. reviewed this unit time and times, but you as a more narrative casual player, what do you think about the Crown and Scouts? Yeah, I think it's really difficult. Okay. Because I think the originality from the looks and the art and everything, it's more silver to gold. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's Valyrian steel because that's something really special or something, wow, like blowing you away. So it's like silver gold on aesthetics. Yep. And unit-wise, I think it's a bronze unit because it's a middle-of-the-road unit. It's like a bread-and-butter unit. It does not have extremities on being lacking something or giving something really special. Yeah. It's a six-point cav unit we've seen before and something that's really... But it's something that was missing in the breath infection. So if you compare, is it something that the breath is need? Yes. Yeah. It's silver gold, but I think it's bronze. So all in all, I give it a silver. Okay, so you go and sit a little yeah, bit in the middle. In the middle, it's a awesome. silver for me. Solid, okay. Solid silver. Okay, cool. Um, for you. Well, technically, and uh, I'm not pointing this out because you mentioned it, but for me, overall, I also thought that would be silver. Yeah. Uh, because if we would look to it, as you said, Valerian steel, it's definitely not because it's not blowing your mind. That's Bobby B, right? And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <that's>, yeah. <laughs> we will get there when Bobby B comes yeah. out. But uh, yeah. no, it's more indeed a silver one for me as well because. Um, it is a unit that really helps getting more tricks in there. Yeah. But again, this unit will be really dangerous with people that know the faction through and through. Yeah. Uh, they will probably benefit the most out of it. And I think for someone that really wants to start with it, it's a good unit. But if you position it wrong, Probably. you can you can lose it. Like in comparison, Starf Outriders, uh, Stark Outriders, they fit the same bill, in my yeah. opinion. You, I uh, also lose them quite fast, if you've seen previous battle reports. Yeah, <laughs> so th that's for me why they're on silver. Uh, and then, yeah, they move slowly. When you look to more competitive sides, I would say towards the gold for people that really know how to, well, abuse them. So, so silver it is. Silver, yes. Yeah. Our first uh, shackle on there will be silver. Ching, <laughs> For the crown and scouts. Sound effects and all. Exactly. So, um, yeah. Thank you all uh, very much for watching this one. Uh, if you enjoyed this one, definitely give it a like. and uh, Subscribe. Subscribe and don't forget to put a comment down here. Um, How do you rate this unit? Yeah. From tin to Valyrian steel. Exactly. And, and as will, always... Will we do more of these times? We'll, we we'll try to do every unit that comes out. We'll more try. And more and more, we'll more will come. So, all right. Thank you all again for watching. And, and as, as always, always happy hobbying. hobbying.